In this video, we're going to talk about running studies in person. And to give you a preview, in the next video, we're going to talk about running studies online. The web has made it much easier to run controlled experiments. And I think that there's a lot of people who run studies that they wouldn't have been able to previously do. But there's also a lot that you can get from watching people. Don't miss out on that. In particular, by watching people live, you can talk to them about what they're doing, get their feedback, see points of confusion, and in general have a much higher bandwidth engagement with the participants in your studies than you would get just out of a clickstream online. So today we're going to talk about planning, executing, and analyzing in-person studies. The first step is to make clear goals. For example, say you were building a room reservation system for a computer science department. One strategy would be to put all the information on one page. Another strategy would put different pieces on different pages. And you might be particularly interested in, if we split things up, does that change whether people will book a right-sized room or not? So before running your study, lay out its scope. You don't need to cover an entire system, especially if you're working on a huge piece of software. It's OK to have a narrow scope. And that scope will be guided by the purpose of your study, what you hope to learn. I encourage you to come up with a hypothesis ahead of time and figure out a way to know whether your hypothesis is true or not. Set up your study in a way such that you can see whether or not people's behavior supported your hypothesis. Book an appropriate place for your study. If the interface is something that will be used in a quiet room, book a quiet room. If, on the other hand, it's going to be used at a train station, test it at a train station. Figure out who you're going to recruit and how and how many people and come up with scenarios that you give people when they come in. You want to make sure that these scenarios are realistic and ideally something that these participants can be motivated to care about, at least put themselves in the shoes of the actual user of the system. So here we have some questions like, will people book the right size room and for the right length of time? And this implies some measures, the size of room that they booked, how long it was booked for. You can also get measures like task completion time, how long it took. And especially if you have realistic users, you can see how this task interleaves with other things they do. So if people are actually booking a room for an actual meeting that they need to have, you might see whether people make notes to themselves to also order food or whether they need to coordinate with people over email first to, for example, get an approximate attendance count. And if you think things like screen size might affect how your users behave, have a screen that's appropriate for what they'll have. So. The simplest thing to do, obviously, is to have a stock set up for everybody that's pretty normal. One danger you can see is that developers often have fancier computers than normal users. So don't test people on the latest, greatest, fanciest thing if what people are going to be looking at your site with is a five-year-old laptop. If you can, try to get at least two people to be present for the study. That way you can have one person who's the facilitator and another one who can take notes. It's important to have concrete tasks, among other things that lets you compare the performance between people. And I encourage you to write them down as opposed to speaking them so that everybody gets the same experience, making it even easier to compare. Here's an example of a creativity task asking people to draw creatures from a novel planet. And you can see that the instructions are pretty clear. And you can see that the instructions are pretty specific, even though the output of the task is really open-ended. And here's an example of a meeting room task. You can see how it gives some concrete details and context. I've been amazed and heartened by how seriously most of the participants in our studies take what they do. And the flip side of that is that sometimes people have left in tears when they've been unable to perform well. In studies, people can feel like they're being put under a microscope. And you have a responsibility to alleviate that stress. For starters, make consent voluntary and make sure that consent is informed. Avoid pressuring people to participate and let them know that they can stop at any time. And maybe the most important rule of all for minimizing stress and increasing the quality of the interaction that you have with participants is remind people multiple times that you're testing the site, the user interface, the system, not them. And that's an important frame change because when you're testing the system, if the user is unable to complete the task, the fault is the system's fault. If participants believe that they're the ones being tested, then, for example, if I'm unable to perform a task that reflects poorly on me and my abilities, and I may be stressed out. If, on the other hand, I as a participant 
believe that I'm helping the designer test the system, then when I encounter a roadblock, it's not a poor reflection of my abilities. It's I've done something good. I've found a bad part of the user interface that I can then help the designer make better. There are several important considerations in a study like this. For example, what's going to be your order of tasks? One good approach to this is to start out with a really simple task to get people warmed up, and then you can move to more complex tasks as you go through the study. Other times, you may shuffle the order so there's no effect of one of the tasks on another one. How much training, if any, are you going to provide? It depends on how the real system is going to be used. If you have a ticket machine, not so much. If you have a surgical system, maybe a little bit more. What are you going to do if somebody doesn't finish? Probably the answer shouldn't be lock them in the room until they do. For a lot of tasks, I, rec I recommend deciding in advance what a reasonable upper bound for time is. And you can let participants know that. Another strategy is that if somebody hits a small stumbling block, you may elect to help them along so that they can get to the rest of the user interface so that you're not purely stalled out on one point. And finally, pilot your study. A pilot participant is somebody that runs through your study before the actual participants. And the main goal of a pilot participant is to work out the kinks in the study design. Also, for a usability study, pilots can find really obvious usability bugs that you wouldn't want to burn real participants on. In fact, I recommend doing two pilots, one with a colleague who may know the interface well, just as a way of getting all of your materials ready, figuring out what the tasks are, all that kind of stuff. Then do another pilot with one real user, and that will help you see a bunch of these kinks that you didn't see ahead of time. I promise you that if you run a pilot, you'll discover things that otherwise would have screwed up the study. And how are you going to capture the results? There's a number of ways of getting feedback from people. At the very least, I recommend having a paper notebook or laptop or other note-taking device handy so that you can note down critical incidents, either aha moments that you have about how to improve the design, things that worked really well, stories that you want to share with other stakeholders, or problems that you'll need to bring back to the design team to try and figure out how to fix. You might record video, and a great reason to record video is it will let you grab those moments of either success or real challenge and share those with other people. Depending on what you're doing, screen recording can serve much the same purpose. It's going to depend on whether you want to gather the user's facial expression or the crisp contents of the user interface. Are you going to interrupt participants if you have a question to ask them about why they're doing what they're doing, if you want to talk to them about some feature of the user interface, or if you'd like to help them get past a stumbling block so that they can get on to the next thing? There's no universal answer to this question. It really depends on what you're hoping to get out of the study. And finally, are you going to ask users to think aloud while they go through the study? The think aloud method can be a really powerful way of getting feedback about a user interface. And here's what I mean by think aloud. Say, for example, you were studying how somebody changes the staples in a stapler. If I were a participant in that study, and I were using the think aloud method, I might start out by saying, well, I'm changing the staples in the stapler because it, uh, it seems to be out. It's not, it's not working anymore. So let's see, I haven't used this stapler before. Um, I'm going to, oh, there we go. OK, so I grabbed the top. I thought that might work. And that opened it up. And uh, I have my staples here. And uh, I'm going to put those right in there and make sure this part goes forward. Oh, that didn't go. There we go. And I'm going to try and close it without getting a staple out. There we go. That's Think Aloud. And it helps you get a window into how people are thinking about the task that they're doing. It's not something that most of us are used to doing. And so you'll need to prompt people at the beginning of the study to think as they're going. And then you'll need to offer prompts during the study as well, prodding people to remember to say what they're thinking or what they're trying to do or any questions that arise or even what it is that they're reading on the screen. So remember to prompt people to keep talking and decide ahead of time what things you will help on and what things you won't. If you can, write that down. Consistency is helpful. Is thinking aloud always going to give you the right answers? No. Among other things, 
if you got to talk while you're doing the task, that may change how you do the task. In some cases, it may mean that you're more effective because by trying to bubble up what it is that's the issue, that may help you get through it. And in another case, it make you, may make you less effective because all of a sudden you have to do two separate things, work the interface, and speak up simultaneously. And at the very least, it's n almost certainly going to slow you down. And you shouldn't take what people say as a veridical representation of what they're thinking. We can almost always give a rationale or reason for something, even if it isn't at all the actual reason. In studies like this, it's usually not because people are being malicious or trying to hide anything. It's usually just because it's usually just because they're trying to help you out and generate an answer. Oftentimes those answers are useful for your design process, but they may or may not be what's actually going on in your noodle. When people arrive, the first thing that you want to do is greet them. So the facilitator is going to welcome the participant, explain what the setup is, explain the overall narrative, the scenarios that they'll do, and get them set up and trained, if necessary, with the interface. During the study, you'll want to collect both process data and bottom line data. The process data tends to be more qualitative and tends to have real insights to it. The bottom line data tends to be more of the numbers that then you'll then use for more quantitative analysis. Bottom line numbers are great for things like task completion time. Did my interface speed people up or increase completion rate? But don't combine it with Think Aloud. The reason? Think Aloud slows you down, and it slows different people down differently. And so the variance in task completion time introduced by Think Aloud means that it just doesn't make that much sense anymore. So if you care both about the numbers and about getting the Think Aloud data, you may want to run those as separate studies. At the end of the study, debrief the participant, both so they learn what your goals were and they can find out more information about what you're trying to do, and also so that you can learn more holistically from them after the completion of everything, what it is that they're thinking. And now that you're through this study, in the next video we'll move on to analyzing the data.